All right, let's look at an example. Um, one thing we forgot to note in the last video for this theorem, this also has the same radius of convergence. as the original power series, right? So both derivative and antiderivative, they preserve the radius of convergence, but not necessarily the interval of convergence. And without seeing a specific you know, concrete example, you can't really make any predictions on what the interval is going to look like. Um, so here is such an example. So what can we say? So one of the things that we know is that f of x has interval of convergence given by what? Minus 1 to 1, right? It's geometric. So we've looked at this example already. Um, now, one of the kind of general rules of thumb, you know, that you might have, and you might have already developed this intuition a little bit, is that uh, when you take derivatives, the domain never gets bigger, right? Sometimes when you take derivatives, the domain shrinks a little bit because you might have, you know, like if you're taking derivatives of things like root functions, sometimes you get an x in the denominator that you didn't have before, right? Um, so derivative sometimes makes the domain get a little bit smaller, but it never gets the domain a little bit bigger. Um, that paired with the fact that the radius of convergence stays the same, seems to suggest that we should reasonably be able to predict that when we calculate the derivative, it should have this same interval of convergence. Well, let's actually confirm that. f prime of x, we just take the derivative term by term, and so we get the sum n going from 1 to infinity of n x to the n minus 1. Okay, And again, if we want to, we can write that as the sum n going from 0 to infinity of n plus 1 times x to the n. Okay, um, If we wanted to test for radius of n and interval of convergence, right, well, I mean, we know the radius. The radius, again, should be minus 1. We can do that with the ratio test. I'll leave that as an exercise, right? If you do apply the ratio test, you're going to get n plus 1 over n plus 2 or n over n plus 1, whichever way you want to look at it. But it goes to 1 in the limit either way, so we get that same radius. Um, Looking at the endpoints, well, you can see pretty easily here that at x equal to 1, you're going to get very much a divergent series, right? You're adding, up, you're adding up all the integers, all the positive integers. Well, the sum of the natural numbers, that definitely doesn't converge, right? Fails the test for divergence. Terms don't go to 0. Same thing at the other endpoint. At minus 1, you're getting an alternating sum of integers. Still doesn't converge. Right? So our intuition is correct. That is the right interval of convergence. Now, what about for antiderivatives? Sometimes you gain a bit with antiderivatives, right? Makes sense. If you sometimes lose a little bit with derivatives, you should gain a little bit for antiderivatives. Antiderivative is going to be what? It's going to be sum and going from 0 to infinity, 1 over n plus 1 x to the n plus 1, possibly plus a constant. So again, ratio test is going to give you, you know, it's going to be like n, n plus 1 over n plus 2. Same story, right? It uh, goes to 1 in the limit. Radius is still 1, but we expect that. It's the promise of the theorem. At the endpoints, what can we say at the endpoints? At plus 1, harmonic, right? x equals 1, we get the harmonic series. At x equals minus 1, we're going to have minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Well, that's the alternating harmonic series. And we've seen now a number of times that the alternating harmonic series does converge thanks to the alternating series test. Okay, So that means that the interval here is going to be minus 1 to 1, including the minus 1, but still not including 1. So 
we gain an endpoint.